Listen, please. What you are about to hear is true. What you are about to hear is fact, not fiction. Sit right where you are and listen. This is important. It's for you. Spreading this idea of fake news is like inviting someone to a pool party who pees in the pool. The world today is very unstable. It's out of balance, and a lot of that is due to the electronic media. Local coverage is declining at a frightening rate. Professional standards are high as ever, but the reach is not there. The money side of the business is still a mess. It's kind of hard to get people to pay for news nowadays. We're used to getting it free. You know, and there's this idea that you want us to pay for yesterday's news. This is a, a challenging period. We have to pay attention to the medium, not the content, which is not to dismiss the content, it's just that the medium is more important. Every medium has a certain bias that structures the content, limits the kind of content, and pushes or suggests what kind of content would work best. You could scroll an entire novel on a TV screen, but that's not good television. You want me to keep talking and talking, which means that I don't really have time to think. I just have to keep spewing out words in order to give you a good video product. That's the bias of the television media. People applied technologies to suit them, and not everybody was always happy. The first version was not always the last version. To take one example, the period of the 1920s when Radio became a really popular household consumer good. Shortly after that, people began to partner new technology of radio with the older practices of journalism and try to evolve a whole new hybrid form, radio news. This is an instance where you would say, in the 1920s, radio came along and that changed everything. But actually, the history is much more complicated than that. Radio, like any technology, is something that people create and then people fight over how to apply it. Who gets to own it or profit from it or control it? How should it be used? It doesn't come with a set of operating instructions. In other words, people have to figure that out. Arguing, suing each other, innovating. That very messy human process was the way that we got news on the radio. Well, news originally is a fairly chaotic substance. I mean, it spread wildly in the market. Twitter or Facebook or uh, Instagram are not as wild as a marketplace with people coming from here and there, spreading stories, people of all ages, talking to all kinds of people. So I think there's something inherently chaotic about the news. America today, in a lot of ways, the world today, is very unstable. It's out of balance, and a lot of that is due to the electronic media. You know, in a way, television threw things out of balance, and we were kind of getting a handle on it when the internet came along and threw things out of balance even more, and the web, and social media, and mobile media. And we keep doing this. We keep introducing these new technologies and these new forms of communication. And I think it's tempting too often in our own time to say, oh, well, because the internet. That's the end of discussion. Well, wait a minute. No, that's not true. I try to emphasize that these are open-ended issues that they need to engage in and realize that all of these things are there for the taking or there for the shaping. Read all about it. Latest football scores. Morning paper. Morning star. So journalism in America has gone through some big transitions. In the beginning, we had a system that was based on printing a newspaper once a week. The only people who could afford a newspaper were people like lawyers, ship captains, merchants, people for whom information was very valuable and they would pay a lot for it. Most of the contents of newspapers and pamphlets were what we would call advocacy. These were people with strong points of view, writing to persuade, they were writing to change society. You look at the greatest pamphleteer of the 18th century, Thomas Paine. His goal was to get rid of King George. That was his measure of success. Newspapers were quickly enlisted on the side of either of the two big political parties that emerged right after the founding of the country. So the country's original news media 
were very partisan, at least as partisan as they are today. In fact, on the whole, I'd say they were more partisan. And they measured their success by how their party did in elections. People tend to forget that right after the Constitution, we had a period of journalism, which is now known by journalism historians as the partisan press, which was rapidly partisan to the point where when editors would meet each other on the street, they'd often get into fights. Maybe partisanship is really the norm in American politics. That's the original tradition in American journalism, writing to affect the world. Then this reporting tradition gets going, which is that mass marketing of reported factual stories. And a new kind of newspaper gets going. It starts to be published every day. And for the first time, this put the burden on the news business to be interesting. And at the same time, there's more and more advertising. And of course, it's contributing more than half of the revenue. So this means that readers are no longer paying the full freight. Starting with those papers in New York that charge just a penny a copy, they became known as the penny press. The idea was, let's go find out new information that the average person will find exciting or interesting or shocking or upsetting. And the new test of success would be the marketplace. And when you think about it, the two areas that you most want to know about would be uh, sex and violence. Violence because it could cut you short, and sex because of the opportunity to reproduce your genes. And so I think there's no coincidence that sex and violence have been so much part of the news for so long and so much part of journalism, and that they tend to sell. And so the Penny Press was tremendously successful. They were so profitable that those publishers could say to the political parties, we don't need you, we are doing fine. In fact, we will tell our readers who we support in each election. And it won't be necessarily one party or the other, we will pick people who we think are doing a good job. And then running alongside them is also a tradition of expose. And by this, we think of incidents that have come to light, often through investigative reporting, linked to a goal of reform, to make the world a better place. Beginning of the 20th century, there's a period of muckraking where a number of investigative reports start landing one after another, exposing the abuses of the Standard Oil Company under John D. Rockefeller, or exposing the pervasive problem of child labor in America. There's that tradition, too, of bringing things to light for the purpose of making society better. And I'm happy to say all these things are flourishing today. You know, you see tremendous reporting, tremendous advocacy, and really great investigative reporting. But you can see the difference every evening. If you look at NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, there in that reporting tradition, whereas MSNBC is in an advocacy tradition. They're just trying to change America every night, and Lester Holt is trying to describe America every night. And they work for the same big corporation, but they have different missions and different identities within it. Some people do get worked up when they're looking at one kind of journalism and they're expecting a different one. So if they're expecting reporting and they get advocacy, they say, oh, see, you're biased, or oh, you're partisan, or you have an agenda. Well, I mean, a lot of people would say, Guilty as charged. Yes, I do. So we go back to the days of broadcast news, and they would have 22 or 24 minutes, and they would always complain. We have to be superficial. It's basically a headline service because we only have this short period of time to do the news. They were all following the same idea. Let's sell to everybody, so let's not have any identity or political signature that would alienate anyone. Objectivity provided cover for journalists who wanted to try to appeal to people of all different political persuasions. It was a way of saying we are factual and not partisan, and therefore you can trust us. It co-evolved with a business model that was trying to be all things to all people. That was maybe the one time in the history of the United States and in the history of the world when most people got their news from the same news system. 
There were three television networks. There were just a handful of newspapers in each town, and they tended to gravitate towards the middle because they didn't want to alienate any potential viewers or readers. At the same time, a lot of newspapers are becoming local monopolies because more and more newspapers can't stand the competition. It becomes clear that there's enough of a market for one really strong survivor in each of the middle-sized cities, and even, even up to some of the bigger cities. There was what Harold Innes called a monopoly of knowledge. There was a monopoly control over news by these organizations. You have the growth of really big media in a lot of new formats. The newspapers and the networks were profitable and professional in their outlook. And I think now we can see in retrospect that that was a period that had a beginning, middle, and end all unto itself. And that period is over. I think we're in the middle of a process of adjustment where the digital revolution has had a lot of impact and people have applied this new digital technology in different ways. Some of them great, some of them not so great. We're in a golden age right now of skills and equipment. The money side of the business is still a mess. The money is not rolling in the way it once was. Professional standards are as high as ever, but the reach is not there. And I see it now with my students graduating into a job market that is slowly getting better. But boy, 10 years ago, it was just a horror show. With the internet, really taking all the money out of selling news. It's kind of hard to get people to pay for news nowadays because we get it all online whenever we want and we're used to getting it free. Again, this is kind of a throwback to the days when you'd walk in the marketplace and you get news and you have to pay for it. People would be eager to tell and you'd be eager to hear. And there's this idea that you want us to pay for yesterday's news when we can get it for free online and, and really Google and, and, and then the social media platforms have, have been responsible for a lot of this. I think what Google and Facebook figured out pretty quick is they'd be a lot more profitable if they could be treated like utilities but have access to content like publishers <laughs> but not have the legal responsibility of making sure that that information is accurate, that it's not libelous, that it doesn't betray any national security secrets. Big news organizations that, are, that do ambitious work have layers and layers of reporters and editors and fact checkers. It's, it's expensive to produce original reporting, especially when you're reporting on topics that somebody wants to keep hidden. That's a big undertaking. Now, to then come along after someone has gone to all those lengths and spent all that money and just say, oh, Thank you very much. I'll take that and I'll post it over here next to an ad for something and not reimburse you even. You know, that's a horrible situation. That's the existential crisis that I think we're facing right now. How do we pay for good original reporting? A few places have figured it out. I think some of the national news organizations are doing fine. It's the medium and small sized city newspapers in America that are just on their backs. And local coverage is declining at a frightening rate. And there's terrible costs to this. There aren't as many reporters covering city councils and mayors and even governors as there used to be, which opens up the possibility of malfeasance, of corruption, without the watchdogs watching. The flood of information, the speed of information, all of this combined to create a, a tremendous problems for us and now with mobile media I mean we're all receptors receiving information all the time instantaneously and it doesn't leave that space for reflecting constantly alert alert something new something new how do we make sense of it how do we separate what's really relevant or really important from what's nonsense but on a, on a macro level, societies that are unable to process information because of this sort of overload fall apart. But there's a solution to a lot of these problems, and it's the same solution. Pay for a digital subscription to a news operation that you trust. If you find that someone is consistently delivering solid news that you like and admire, 
and it's coming to you for free through Facebook, well, okay, time to pony up. You should, you should go back to the original source and subscribe. That's the way to really guarantee that we will have good journalism forever.